country. Um, his specialty and love is being very complicated eyes. And so, um, uh, as, as folks know, ophthalmology cases are has joined the conference. Us, and also um, sometimes uh, some of the um, most difficult for us to, to figure everything out because the, the, the problems encountered are so complicated and often use a vernacular that, that's not, you know, that not all of us have. So we're very lucky to have uh, such a luminary in the field. And without uh, further ado, let me turn the floor over to you, Dr. Lambert. Uh, good morning. Thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, that's uh, way beyond what I'm, what I'm, but anyway, uh, I uh, had, had some questions and can everyone see the screen? Yeah, we can. I, I think everyone should be able to see your PowerPoint well. Has left the conference. Okay. Uh, when Kelly called me and asked me what to present, I, I thought about several different things, and we discussed talking about age-related macular degeneration, uh, retinal detachment, and then I decided uh, I'll, I would, with something that you probably have never seen, which are actual video uh, videos of cases uh, and unusual cases in vitreal surgery. Today are to describe the techniques involved in vitreoretinal surgery to improve vision and present four unusual cases treated with vitreoretinal surgery via videos. Um, I should mention that I have no proprietary interest in any uh, instrument, technique, or the like in here, although I've designed some of the instruments. Um, I join conference. I usually don't uh, join the conference. Get or anything like that. Uh, starting, I'd like to mention Robert Mockamer. Roger, uh, Robert Mockamer was the father of vitreoretinal surgery, our whole entire specialty. Um, and he's originally from Germany and came to Baskin Palmer Eye Institute uh, in the late 60s to do retinal research. And he watched a fellow named David Kasner do open sky vitrectomy, which means that he took the cornea off and moved the lens and was removing some vitreous to see if he could do that. And Mockamer thought about it and uh, wondered why we couldn't go into the eye and remove the vitreous without having to do uh, the corn removal and removal of the lens in the front part of the eye. Together with an instrument designer, John Marie Perel and Helmut Butner, and uh, they decided to invent um, closed vitrectomies. Uh, Dr. Mockamer, actually his garage in a floor at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute or near Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. This is a Black & Decker drill and he's drilling into an egg to see if he can remove the yolk of the egg without move, removing the I white of the egg. the conference. Egg, uh, which found he could do. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he developed pancreatic cancer and passed away to, on the 23rd of December 2009. Uh, for many of us, I trained with him and, and many of the other people who trained with him, many, many people who did not train with him, but uh, Baskin in his knowledge, uh, our innovator, a mentor, te teacher, role model, and, and most of all, friend. And he was a really close friend with uh, myself. And um, I remember him uh, as one of the, the three, you know, three to five, five people in your life that you want to be like. And he's one of those for me. Talk about the uh, normal eye. Um, how many of you are ophthalmologists on the call? Are there any ophthalmologists on the call? I suspect there were, you know, we have some. Um Two ophthalmologists who write up uh, the clinical memories for us, but I don't think any of them okay. are on right now. That's what I figured, and so I thought I would show you a ba the basics of the eye. This is the cornea, the watch glass in the front part of the eye, uh, the rest as you would expect from this picture. This lens that people uh, develop cataracts in, and uh, they actually remove the innards of the lens, uh, the cataract extraction, and place an intraocular lens in the eye. And the intraocular lens is actually placed here, right behind the iris, uh, it's a posterior chamber lens. Okay, there's a lens placed in front of iris, and that's called an anterior chamber lens. So when you hear of intraocular lenses, those are placed there. Uh, the retina is actually the orange material that you see uh, in the back part of the eye that starts here at an area called the pars uh, plana. And there, there's an area that overlaps where the vitreous uh, grows from in a baby and the vitreous grows posteriorly and is along the surface of the retina. Uh, anteriorly is the ciliary body, and the ciliary body is this uh, structure here that the lens connects to, and right behind that is 
this smooth area called the pars plana. Dr. Murr figured that this very avascular area, and perhaps you would be able to enter the eye through this area and do surgery. And that's, the, that's how the pars plane of the trachectomy came to be. That's how we get into the eye. Well, what happens if, um, how many of you have floaters? Or is there anyone on here that has floaters, uh, have had a retinal detachment, or have had a retinal tear? Anyone else? Well, you've probably heard people complain of floaters, and particularly people over the age of 50. Most, uh, many have floaters. Floaters occur when the vitreous starts to contract. The vitreous is, was designed to last maybe 45 or 50 years, and then it starts to contract and collide, as you see in the picture here. So it, this is called vitreous cineresis, and the vitreous uh, li becomes a liquid, and liquefaction occurs, and the collagen fibrils that are in the vitreous, and I tried to, I drew these drawings, so, you know, they're not uh, they're not professional. Uh, these collapse and, and coalesce, and those are what we call floaters. There is a connection of the vitreous around the nerve, and that's the slow round thing, and many people see this round thing floating around their vision that collapses to like a paramecium looking thing. And uh, that's called a Weiss ring that is very common in patients. Trees can detach, as you can see back here. This is the posterior uh, portion of the vitreous called the posterior hyloid for ophthalmologists. And uh, it can suddenly detach and people can suddenly cause uh, sea floaters and many people come in for that. Uh, traction on the retina can cause a tear in the retina, and that's what leads to a retinal detachment. The pulling away can actually pull on the retina. Those are called uh, flashes, and, and those are truly flashes of light. And the reason is, is because the retina has no pain fibers. The only message it can send to your brain are flashes of light. And so as the vitreous pulls away, you start seeing lots of flashes. And they're usually in the periphery because the central ones uh, are Although my wife, that's where, that's where she saw hers. So, you know, what do you go? Uh, if the vitreous keeps pulling on the retina, sometimes it's a little too adherent, as you can see here, and will cause a tear in the retina. And uh, the turn on this tear will allow this fluid that's now inside of the vitreous cavity, which is the breakdown of the vitreous, which is ma mainly hyaluronic acid, um, very to helon. And, and uh, root the stuff that rooster combs are made of, they put in the anterior chamber when they're doing cataract surgery. Uh, fl now fluid, and this is still a vitreous gel, that gets under the retina, and the retina starts detaching um, wallpaper coming off of the wall. Uh, and that's a retinal detachment. Uh, one of the ways that the retina can be fixed is called a scleral buckle. And this is, was started in the 30s by a man named Custodis, and uh, they put a band around, we put a band around the eye and actually push the outside against the inside to relieve the traction on this tear. And at the same time, either uh, from cryotherapy or laser around the tear to nail it down. And that's just the retina, as you can see here. And the patient has had gas bubble placed, in, uh, gas bubble placed in the eye, just an injection of air. And you position the patient so the air is actually pushing the whole host while the laser or the cryo does its thing. Now, not what I'm going to talk about today, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, for those of you who've never heard of a retinal detachment, uh, explain that to you. And this is a scleral buckle really being placed in a patient. Uh, the buckle is placed under this, the muscles and then is sewn to the eye in all four quadrants. And then it's tightened down with this little little bear called a Watsky sleeve. So you pull on both of these and tighten it down. And if we other talk someday, we'll do one on retinal detachment and, and, uh, and complicated scar tissue in the eye, and uh, we can we can go into that in detail. Well, the pars plane of vitrectomy, there are three incisions placed into the eye. Um, there are sodomies, we call them, uh, for all three of them. Two of them are for instruments, and one of them is for an infusion cannula to place fluid into the eye. Uh, the instruments that we place in the eye are leading. We have a zillion different instruments, and as uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, I've invented all of them along with many, many other people. But this is what it looks like. Uh, whether it's uh, 20 gauge or 20 gauge, 25 gauge, or now 27 gauge, uh, these are all very small. The largest instruments that we use are 20 gauge, which are 0.89 millimeters in width, and down from there. Uh, we would make one incision and place a cannula 
in, and fluid would be going into the eye through this cannula. And through these instruments, one is a light, and many times we have light uh, w uh, with other things like a pick or forceps or something attached to it. And this is the vitreous cutter, or very similar to the vitreous cutter that we use, which it removes the vitreous. This is a high cutter that can cut it uh, 2,500, 3,000 cuts uh, per minute, and uh, you very quickly can remove the vitreous jelly from the eye. Well, all this led to what to talk about today are some of the cases uh, in, uh, that are unusual and that we use vitrectomy to fix. I'm not going to talk about fixing retinal detachments today, although I'll show you a picture of removing vi uh, uh, of removing uh, vitreous hemorrhage uh, along with the Cherson syndrome later on. We're going to talk about macular translocation, which was a, a technique designed to treat macular degeneration. It was uh, designed to move the retina to a location to allow uh, good retina to be over the area of the center part of vision in hopes of improving vision in patients. Uh, it, did, it turned out it did not work very well for uh, macular degeneration, but it turns out it's well for other things, which is what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about a patient that has an optic pit, which is an patient in the nerve that can allow fluid to get under the retina and cause ischesis, which is the splitting of the retina and the retinal detachment centrally syndrome, which can occur many times with uh, head trauma when they have a, a subdural hematoma or intercal hemorrhage, and it actually goes from there into the eye, or the increase in pressure in the brain causes blood to be uh, leased into the eye. We'll talk about that. Finally, I'm going to end up with a very interesting case uh, on optic nerve head drusen uh, that we performed way back in 1997. It's still an interesting case, however. Okay, macular translocation. Uh, the first patient is a 55-year-old white female that had a history of retinal detachment that was aired by scleral buckling, as you saw a few minutes ago, and that's why I showed you that uh, three months prior. Her vision was 6200, and she was told that nothing else could be done to fix her retina. She was referred in uh, to see if there was anything else we could do. And uh, what we thought of was this macular translocation that we had used for macular degeneration, but we're disappointed in the results that we received. Uh, this had all the instrumentation. Uh, which was a good thing to have since uh, this helped. Um, in macular translocation, what we do basically is detach the retina with cannulas that you're going to see in a minute in the video. And we uh, made the sclera smaller by taking sutures and, and actually contracting the sclera, making it smaller, and then putting gas bubble in the eye and reattaching the uh, retina from the periphery to the posterior, effectively moving the retina from one location down to a, a location inferior to that. Uh, the idea to get new retina over the center part of vision to see if we can return the center part of vision, and it turns out that that doesn't work well in macular degeneration because the problem is actually below the retina um, and the cells, they're damaged uh, in, in the entire macula. This is the lady. You can see folds going through. The, this is the center part of her vision here. And I haven't, haven't talked about the anatomy in the eye. This is the optic nerve. These are the folds going around the center part of the vision. And they're folds that are actually elevated towards you, which you'll see in the photo in just a second. Uh, so this should be flat here. And as a result of these undulating folds, uh, she cannot see very clearly. And now you'll notice that the folds go the opposite direction. The reason they go the opposite direction is because we operate from the top of the eye. So we're above the eye and everything is reversed uh, for a normal picture if the patient was sitting up. The patient is now lying down and we're looking uh, at the reverse of the eye. This is a small cannula, a 40 gauge cannula, which is well, gosh, less than 0.1 millimeters in width. And what I'm here is, is touching it to the retina and then in applying an injection that is going to penetrate the retina and then detach what's well, already detaching. You can see the uh, fluid here. Uh, all the rest of the videos are much clearer than this. But this is the first case I did, and I wanted to show you what it looked like uh, on the first the first time you wanted to try this. So we're going to detach several different areas. We found when we were doing this for macular regeneration that if you just injected it in one place, you just get a big bubble in that local area. So you have to inject in several different areas. Uh, and then coalesce them to 
together detachment. So you can see we're we're calling this area to detach, and this is above the area of the folds, which are down on here. Detachment forming there. Can you out? Yeah, it's uh, clear. Yeah, you good. Um, I left our 3D glasses um, at home, but, but uh, yeah, I left my 3D camera at home too. <laughs> So uh, we have now detached the entire macula. Here is the nerve now on this side, and, and the vest going around. And again, this is upside down because we're at the head of the bed uh, of the patient instead of at, normally uh, with the patient. Uh, uh, this is fluid called perfluoron. This is a fluid that's heavier than water, and uh, we've been using this around 1988 or 1989 with Dr. Stanley Chang uh, in York, and we found it instead of having to invert people and put gas in to reattach the retina, we could use heavier than water fluid to push the retina back into position. This is this is allowed us to push the retina down, as you can see, uh, now flatten the macula part and we're removing fluid uh, area, uh, say, uh, and reattaching uh, the, this part of vision so those folds are gone. On the far right over here, you can see the fold extended to the far periphery. The sural buckle is right about in this area out here in the black, so you can't see it uh, because of the, light, the way the, the, the side of the light. Um, then we uh, have the retina in position. That was the original tear, actually, of the retinal attachment. What we're doing is intraocular laser there to reattach the retina. Leave PFO in place to make sure the macula stays flat. I then fill the eye with uh, air, and we, we're removing fluid in the periphery uh, from under the retina, so there's no fluid under the retina anymore. Uh, we're putting a gas bubble in to hold the retina in place, moving the perfluoron uh, from the back of the eye. The PO or perfluoron can't be left in the eye because it can do damage over time, so we use it as a temporary tamponade uh, in each of these cases. is through the infusion cannula, air is going in, and with this instrument, we are sucking the fluid out, basically. So we're taking all of the fluid out over the perfluoron, and the last thing we're going to take out is the perfluoron, so we keep the macula flat and attached. I mentioned before, in age-related macular degeneration, we weren't able to improve vision, so we weren't sure that this was going to work in these patients either. Uh, but it turns out the problem uh, with age-related macular degeneration, as I mentioned, are the cells below the retina, the, the photoreceptors and the RPE cells. And in these patients, uh, the photoreceptors and the RPE cells are normal. They, they have just had a retinal detachment, not, not uh, to the cells below them. And so those cells are still totally functional. If you get the, the retina back into its normal position, uh, you can uh, markedly improve their vision. And you'll see uh, um, the first cases that I did. This was uh, around 2001, something like that, and uh, I've done five or six of these cases, and you're going to see the results of the first four actually here in this presentation. Um, now back in the back and removing the perfluoron, and you can see the the folds are much gone here. There's a fold in the periphery that I lasered around earlier, and that was the laser that you saw. The, those white marks were actually laser marks and the laser will cause a scar over a period of time, but you get an initial adhesion from the laser uh, just at the time that you do it, actually. That's uh, maybe 60 or 70%. Now, the is flat, and you can see the remainder of the fold going out to the periphery. Putting a little fluid over the macula to make sure that all the perfluoron is gone because it's heavier than water. If you put fluid over it, um, any PO or perfluoron that's left will coalesce into a small bubble, and then you can remove it and make sure that um, uh, that you removed all of it. And that little snake cannula, it's called, and uh, it's a soft-tipped cannula that's uh, made out of poly uh, material that is very soft, and so you don't do any damage to the the nerve or the retina by doing that. Okay, now the retina is reattached, and what look like 12 months uh, post-op, and by team, and you can see that there are no folds here at all. The fold way out here, the one that you saw, 
and uh, she had distortion in her vision, and by 18 months, she'd improved to 20-25 after cataract extraction, and six years after the surgery, she remained 20-25. Uh, did three other cases, and interestingly, they, uh, we uh, this case, uh, again, returned to 20-25. Third case returned to 20-30 at 15 months. She actually ended up 2020 ultimately. And case three also ended up 2025. So, although the procedure did not work for macular degeneration in patients that have normal RPE and normal photoreceptors, it's a great procedure, and uh, we can return vision to these people who are happy when you do that. Uh, another, does anyone have any questions? I should have mentioned that if you have any questions along the way, interrupt me because I tend to talk fast and um, down, but if you have any questions, please just interrupt me. I'm more than happy to answer anything. Thank you. I think we're good. Uh, second case was also another macular translocation case that I just wanted to show you that this is not only good for uh, problems that occur after retinal detachment, but can occur in other diseases. So are any of you familiar with Coates disease? Oh, cases uh, through best doctors, sure. Okay. Uh, Coates disease, as you know, from best doctors, uh, many kids are found that have leukocoria or a white pupil, and they have Coates disease, which is a, a telangiectatic uh, better structure in the uh, that is hereditary. It actually occurs in one eye and more often in males than females, and they'll have a, a, a lot of central vision due to massive exudation, or in some cases because of formation of folds, with exudation more in the periphery and scar tissue more in the periphery this patient has. This is a man uh, who had a fold right through the macula. Again, this is the center part of vision right here. And this is the optic nerve and the vessels. And again, this is going to be upside down because we're going to be coming in with our instruments from up here at the head of the table. And so everything looks reversed. You can see the dedication from the Coates disease. And further on the periphery out here are, is uh, scar tissue that's actually holding this fold in place. And so we're going to work on that um, in surgery. So I'm looking right to the surgery here because we've already looked at the other. You can see the massive exudation that's occurring out here. In many patients, as I mentioned, this can be so massive it gets to the center part of the vision and they have a white, white pupil. Uh, so first of all, I tried just putting perfluorin in after we remove the vitreous to see if we could just flatten this area down. And I'm out temporal to the area of the center part of the vision, the fovea. Uh, that didn't work. So I went to a macular translocation needle and we're going to detach the center part of vision again, as we had done in the other patients. And you see, as you're injecting, uh, you, it's a very light injection uh, to detach the retina. The first time you do it, it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, after you've done a few of them, uh, it's, it, it's uh, become uh, pretty simple to do. And this is attaching inferior to the center part of vision. Again, it's reversed because we're working from the top part of the eye. You can see this detached already. It's detached up in the black area up here, and now we're coalescing the entire detachment, and this will all come together, and uh, we will uh, completely detach the center part of vision, um, probably half of the retina, basically. So even though I'm injecting here, this is detaching over here. Because it's progressing over to the area that's already detached and stretching this out. And the field is going away, but you can see there's still traction lines to the periphery that we're going to have to address uh, before we're able to reattach the macula and, and then fall. And you see the attachment here is progressing even though I'm injecting down here because this is coalescing. This is all coalescing together. And now you have a retina. I just want to ask, when you're injecting, what's the risk of, um, I'm just thinking of like those, um, ever get those um, things, tube, like back in the day when one puts a little bit of um, discrete stuff on the end of the straw and then blows up those bubbles and can make those bubbles that, and then you pinch it off and then make the little bubbles that you play with. Um, you that, can, yeah. yeah. Anyway, do you ever you blow that up and then it kind of pops a hole in the other end? Uh, never had that happen because we're very gentle doing that. that. That was one of the big worries when we started doing 
macular translocations. Uh, what I'm more worried about, this is, uh, let me tell you real quickly about this. This is the scar tissue that I was talking about in the periphery. We're removing scar tissue and actually uh, making an incision. We've made an incision in the retina out here and removing scar tissue from around it. Uh, one hand has forceps, the other has a light, and we're um, uh, taking the tissue off that has contracted in the periphery and is keeping the retina from going down. And now you see the retina back here has flattened down and you're lasering again. This is the intraocular laser. This is all exudation all through this entire area. And we now have an incision right here uh, to this part to lie down. And uh, the laser will uh, cause the retina to scar down to the layers below it. And then we have air fluid exchange here. Uh, you mentioned the injection. Uh, the, the big thing we worry about with the injection is actually injecting too hard, damaging the RPE and the, and the photoreceptors around the area of the injection, or extending the size of the hole, which would cause a hole that would not be self-sealing. Many times they're self-sealing. This is silicon oil. Uh, you may have heard that we sometimes put silicon oil in the eye, and uh, what it does will, is hold the retina in place. I was worried that his retina would not stay attached because of the scar tissue that he already had, and I'm, I filled his eye with silicon oil to keep the retina attached uh, over time, and that uh, was the case, and he did have return of vision, um, although it was only like to the 2060, 2080s level, uh, it's still much better than the, what he had, which was basically life perception. Um, but it wasn't effective for macular degeneration. It was effective for other types of folds that can occur in the macula. Um, so any questions on, on retinal folds and reattachment? The thing I'd like to talk about is an optic pit and retinal detachment. And what an optic pit is, as I mentioned, is an indentation in the optic nerve that we can, can connect with the, we think, to the uh, central nervous system, and fluid from the central nervous system can get under the retina, and or I think more likely, uh, actually, the, at the area of the optic pit, the vitreous pulls on the edge of the retina, causing a small tear, allowing fluid to get under the retina from the traction of the vitreous right at the edge of the optic tip. Um, we first saw a patient in 2005, and she's an internal medicine uh, physician. Uh, she was 13 years old, and she had no retinal detachment, no uh, splitting of the retina, which is called schesis. Vision was good. She had 20-30 vision in the eye with the pit and 20-20 vision in her left eye that had no pit, which is very common. It's usually only in one eye. With 30 vision, and she now has fluid under the retina. This is an OCT, ocular coherence tomography, and there's a light uh, a as an, a machine that's been developed in the last 10 years that allows us to look across the retina like we were doing a cross-sectional cut across the retina. You all of this fluid under here that normally make you think that this patient was, you know, maybe 2,100 or, or, or hand mode vision, and she's 2030, so we're continuing to watch her at this point. You see that there are still cells down here, and there are connections, so the filters are still attached. And this is called schesis when the retina splits like this, but it is not truly detached. It's uh, it, it, when they develop a true detachment, the vision really drops down, which will happen to her. This is November of 2006, and what her retina looks like, uh, looking at it in a picture. Oh, let me back up once and show you the optic pit. This is the optic pit right here, this little thing at the optic nerve. This is the entire optic nerve. This is normal nervous structure, and this is the little indentation we see in the center part of the um, optic nerve, excuse me, that's cup. And uh, many times you'll hear us talking about the cup disc ratio in, in patients with glaucoma. The larger the cup, uh, the more likely it is you're going to develop glaucoma. The pit is a separate structure and actually is much goes much deeper that you'll see in just a second. This is the OC of the optic nerve, and you can see this pit extends way down into the optic nerve. Why many people thought that perhaps etiology is uh, spinal fluid is coming under the retina and causing the detachment into the macular region. And laser right along the edge of the pit. Uh, many people have done that. Uh, the success rate is not very high doing the laser, and 
she uh, elected uh, not to do that, actually. Uh, she uh, for two years, uh, and the macula continued to be elevated, but then her vision started dropping. She dropped to 2060, and her macular function uh, became poor, and she was having trouble doing her job as an internal medicine doc uh, with, stere with no stereopsis. Uh, by, by this time, she'd also progressed to where the thickness was 1,109 microns, uh, in, which is very thick, and she'd start to develop a detachment here as well. You see these little lines that are still connecting the right together, but uh, they're starting to split, and the part of vision is, is almost gone uh, in this case. So we discussed various options. She elected to go ahead with surgery. Um, I'm going to skip this slide because I'm going to show you what we're going to do right here. Uh, injected in her eye, uh, Kellogg, which is a steroid, as you know, uh, that is white. And when you inject it in the eye, you can mark the vitreous. And in her, her vitreous is so adherent that we would be able to, sh to be sure we were removing all of the vitreous and uh, marked it with that. And you can see here, I think, in the right hand, this is, I'm using suction to pull the, the vitreous up. And you see this line here where the vitreous is being peeled away from the retina. And in the other hand, I have a lighted pick, and I'm using the lighted pick to aid in peeling the vitreous off. And you can see the vitreous coming off of the retina and the uh, it, it coming up. And with the, the cut in a second, we're going to be removing the vitreous and this catalog uh, that's uh, showing you where the vitreous is. I'm moving uh, the vitreous on the interior part, portion as well. And this is the macula. And see that the vitreous is now separated from the macula and is up here in the breeze. Um, we removed with the vitreous cuts before, as I mentioned, right at the optic pit, the little vitreous that's still attached, making me think that the vitreous plays a role in this. And in fact, the vitreous pulling as you get older may be the cause of the fluid getting under the under the center part of the vision. Sorry, this is not centered, but um, now it is. Uh, so. We did it a very light laser right where the pit uh, meets the retina to see if we can close that down. And over the next several days, some scar can occur and close the hole in the retina. So we put a gable in her eye and uh, brought her back. And two weeks post-op, here she is, retached again. And it's 2200. Her stromacular thickness has gone down from 1100 and something to 800 something, but she's still detached. So we realized we needed to do even more to get her attached. Some people will attach with that. So she said to go ahead and have surgery again. And this time we elected to really flatten her down and do something that hadn't been done, which is laser in a grid in the macula to see if we could cause adhesion in the macula itself, which meant to the center part of our vision, put silicone oil in and leave it in for months to see if we could reattach her. And she's very good about staying face down at night when she was sleeping and then she worked during the day. Um, the training has already been done. We're using the PFO, that's the profile we talked about earlier, to flatten the macula. It's now flat. And now we're using the laser. And I'm just kind of washed out because actually the light is the laser tip and that's the light. Uh, so we, we've done laser around the center. This is where she focuses, right here in the center of the phobia. And we've uh, done laser around this area to try to nail this down, if you will, uh, over time. And put silicone oil in her eye, and she, at six weeks, had flattened out quite nicely, and by three months, uh, was really thinned down to 337 microns. Her vision was still 2400. She left it in place, and uh, by 10 months postoperatively, she looked normal. Her macula was back to a normal looking macula. She 2070 with silicone oil in place. Your vision is usually worse with silicone oil because it different optical uh, properties than the normal fluid in your eye. And um, at uh, two, removed the oil, she was already 20, 30. Uh, at 18 months, she'd had no change. In the, and uh, the last time I saw her, uh, she was um, four years old and was still, still 20, 25 in that eye. So uh, the surgery on these patients, which it wasn't done in the past, uh, it's to be very, very effective, and that's one of those patients. Uh, on time. Are we 20 minutes? 20. I usually like to leave about five minutes setting in for questions. 
Okay, uh, I will uh, speed up a little bit here because I'm going to show you some interesting cases. Any of you familiar with Thurston syndrome? A little bit earlier, this is a condition that occurs many times um, after uh, trauma to the head. Uh, can occur from subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage. Um, it was first described by Lytton in 1881 and then by Turson, who got credit for it. And uh, more recently has been described to include any type of intracranial hemorrhage that's associated with the vitreous hemorrhage. And that's what this is. The top picture here, uh, there is vitreous hemorrhage and you can't see the back of the eye. Likewise, they can't see out and their vision is very, very poor. My patients have been referred by a Texas Institute of Rehabilitation and Research after someone has had a crushed skull. Um, and, uh, some of the reasons, uh, ruptured cerebral aneurysms, trauma, post-surgical intracranial hemorrhage, tumors, and strangulation among other things. So these are the strangulated people that live. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. I'll stop right on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the one that, you know, the surgery is uh, very good. But anyway, <laughs> so the, the, the pathology is still in question. Uh, some people believe that the crani uh, the intracranial, he the interocular hemorrhage has come from the intracranial hemorrhage down the optic nerve. Some people believe it's due to a sudden rise in the venous pressure due to pressure in the, in the brain. And, and the vein pops in the eye, uh, leading to a hemorrhage. And some people believe it's a sudden rise in the intracranial hemorrhage that causes the optic nerve to swell. And because of the swelling, uh, pops a, a vessel leading to the hemorrhage in the eye. Um, we looked at 74 consecutive, uh, uh, Dr. Freiberg actually looked at 74 consecutive uh, arachnoid hemorrhages and found that 28% of them had some type of intraocular uh, hemorrhage. Um, and 15% uh, of them were retrohyloid, and I'll talk about what that means in a minute. Uh, we looked at 18 eyes of 12 patients between 2001 and 2008. It intended a review of approximately 60 patients that I'd done between 1992 and 2008. Uh, but it turns out, TRR had, had thrown away the charts before 2001, so I couldn't go back in their charts and get the information, so we were only able to review uh, eight, 18 eyes instead of around 60, which would have been by far the largest paper anybody had ever written. Anyway, uh, had non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage. Seven of the patients were females and five were males, and the average age was 38. Uh, there was one surgeon who did the surgery, which is me. And um, the joint hemorrhages uh, five were caused by uh, aneurysms popping, uh, one head trauma in three eyes of two patients, uh, motor vehicle accidents or crushed skulls, in four eyes and assault in uh, one eye. Uh, hemorrhagic uh, stroke basically that occurred and uh, in, in four eyes uh, of two patients that caused the Thurston syndrome. One of them was Lexicon actually a uh, status post craniotomy. Here was to go in and remove the vitreous and remove the, intra, uh, the limiting membrane that we'll talk about in just a second. And here is the surgery. Uh, again, this is the optic nerve over here and right here, actually. And you can't see very well because this is a dense vitreous hemorrhage that's turned dark. We've now moved most of the dense vitreous hemorrhage. And interestingly, it will be either very dark or white. Uh, the vitreous will turn white in many patients that have a long-standing hemorrhage. So here's the optic nerve. This is the inner part of the vision. And you can see this little <laughs> bursa around here as well. And so remove this with the cutter. And in our periphery, there's still a hemorrhage uh, present that we'll remove at the end of the case. But we're uh, removing um, this vitreous hemorrhage, and then we're going to work on this burst in the center. One of the things that occurs with this is we we think the hemorrhage occurs right uh, on the nerve because they can get both hemorrhage under the internal limiting membrane, which, which is a membrane that is the top surface of the uh, retina, and also in the vitreous cavity. So. At that point in time, there was hemorrhage under this membrane here, which is actually the top surface of the retina. Uh, and you can see a little hemorrhage left there. So remove the vitreous hemorrhage, and now we're removing the membrane that has occurred as a result of the hemorrhage with the retina itself. This isn't uh, something that's required in the retina. In fact, in many surgeries, we now remove the internal limiting membrane uh, to aid in the retina being reattached and flattened. Watch here. You can see this with this one forceps. We're going to peel this off. The other has the light, 
And in particular instance, we didn't need the lighted pick or uh, lighted forceps uh, in the opposite hand. It just needed the view. And I would keep the light way back so that you could actually see the membrane being removed. If you get down really close, as you'll see in the optic uh, nerve duration, uh, it makes it very hard to see the, the light being removed. Any questions about the surgery? Again, these instruments are about uh, 0.8 millimeters in width or less, and um, very fine. Very sort of the neurosurgery instruments. It's a very, very, uh, very near to us because we, we started using these before they did actually. Uh, big membranes being removed, and, and the last part of the video is just taking off this little membrane. Uh, actually, in many of these patients, you don't need to put in oil, you don't need to put in gas, you don't need to do anything else but move, remove the hemorrhage unless they have a tear. Um, and you can see that being removed and the blood coming off with it that was still uh, uh, under the brain in there. Whoops. Um, these patients did very well with an average post-operative vision of 2034, or basically 2030, about the median of 2025. Most of the patients had great vision. Two patients only had fix and follow vision because they had severe uh, brain damage. And the one I think of the most is one that had a depressed skull fracture uh, that was in uh, bed all the time and, and could basically only signal us that, uh, that they could see. Uh, but the majority of patients do extremely well with this, with this in that initially was thought not to be bearable. Over last case, and this is a very unusual case, a patient that developed Optic nerve head drusen. Has anyone ever heard of optic nerve head drusen? No. Okay. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I'd like to thank all of these people that you see here for their help in doing this case because, again, this is a, this is another uh, first-of-its-kind type case. Um, this is a one year old lady that was referred to me in 1997 with a history of decreased vision in both for two years. She had acute vision loss in the leg and was diagnosed inaccurately, I might add, uh, having histoplasmosis and, and a subfovial choroidal neovascular membrane. She probably had the membrane because people with optic nerve head drusen can get the membrane. And she had laser photocoagulation three times to this membrane in the center part of her vision, causing a, a dense scar in the center that you'll see right here. Uh, scar, uh, this is the optic nerve, okay? And you see these bumps in here? Can you make those out, those little things? Those are optic nerve head drusen. They're basically rocks that are formed in the optic nerve and come from the nerve, nerve vascular bundle in there, damaging nerves and damaging the vessels. And sometimes they'll develop a subretinal membrane that can be lasered. Uh, the problem when you laser it, uh, you also form a scar that, that decreases the vision. She pressed to really poor vision, um, but correctly diagnosed with bio optic nerve head drusen. Uh, by Dr. Paul Deekert at Scott and White Clinic in Temple, Texas. Um, he referred her over and said, is there anything you can do for, for her surgically? Um, and so here is uh, a picture of the drusen. You, can you see these things? If we could look, if you see in 3D, I really wish we had the 3D capability because these are sticking out at you. It's like a, an optic nerve filled with rocks. Just the loss of color around the optic nerve because there's so much pressure going on here that the patient has developed an ischemic optic neuropathy in this eye as well. Uh, the other eye, and also with optic nerve head drusen, relatively good vision. So what did she present with? She presented with 2200 vision in the uh, right eye, which was the good eye, and no light perception in the left eye. Uh, she had a scan pupil, which would go along with the no light perception vision, normal pressure, significant drusen as you saw, her capillary changes, those pitch changes that I talked about, and she had no histospots in the periphery of the eye, which uh, she had been diagnosed with histoplasmosis, but had no other findings of histoplasmosis other than the, the, the scar, which presumably was a subretinal membrane in the center part of vision, but was long gone. So this one again in the right eye, the 20, 2200, these are the drusen in the left eye with the big scar. We did an ultrasound. CT scan and referred her to a neuro-ophthalmologist, Dr. Andy Lee, who's now the chairman of ophthalmology at Weill Cornell Methodist in Houston, 
uh, Wildcorn is a, uh, a, a third medical school for them that's in Houston at the Methodist Hospital in Houston. And you can see these rocks in the optic nerve. nerve. These little, there should be anything here that reflects like uh, hard substance or like bone. Uh, but this is the use of the optic nerve head drusen uh, in the nerve of, of this patient. Uh, and a neuro ophthalmology evaluation uh, with an MRI did all the normal lab looking for other causes of decreased vision. And the only thing he could find was the optic nerve head drusen, as we had suspected, and felt that she had secondary optic atrophy due to that. The of the optic nerve were first described by Don Gass, who uh, has since passed away, but made one of the best books about medical retina that, that we all use, actually. Um, they're calcified extracellular bodies, so they're outside of the cells of the optic nerve and in the nerve itself. And they're very much like um, the eye uh, that forms in the optic nerve. I uh, know why that occurs, but uh, research is just only going to determine it. Um, most patients with optic nerve head drusen have no symptoms. You just find them on routine exam. However, some will progress to a, a visual loss with optic nerve head swelling that because the blood supply is interfered with. It, as you get strangulated, uh, they developed an inter, uh, anterior ischemic optic neuropathy picture. Central vein occlusions can occur, central artery occlusions can occur, and they can develop subretinal mu vascular membranes with bleeding and exudate. Okay, so this is the neuroperception eye that has all of the things on the right-hand side that I just mentioned, it's basically all of the findings that, of the bad things that can occur with optic nerve hydrosin. The uh, question was, can you remove optic nerve hydrosin from the optic nerve and help a patient that has this problem? So I called a couple of my friends, uh, Robert Mockamer, who was obviously then side, and is the, the fellow I mentioned at the beginning of the talk who in our specialty, and Grossenklaus, who's a, a pathologist, uh, ophthalmic pathologist at Emory University. Um, I was on faculty at Emory for a period of time, and Hans and I were closely doing a bunch of papers on um, macular degeneration, actually. He said, I don't know if you can remove them, but if you do, send them to me so I can do the pathology. So I said, hey. Uh, Mockermer uh, recommended that we operate on the blind eye, interestingly. I've never operated on a blind eye before. Uh, and presented this to the patient, and she said, well, let's see if it works before we work on my quad that's 2200. Uh, what you see was there was a single large drusen, or actually I learned at surgery, a single large drusen here, and there were a bunch of small drusen um, uh, opposite side, which is the nasal side. This is the temp side, and this is the scar. This is the surgeon's view, and we're looking from the top. So I her to surgery, and... Um, had any time. Uh, we have removed the vitreous, and we're now at the back of the eye. Again, this is the eye with the bad drusen in the no light perception vision. Uh, made an incision using an MVR blade. This MVR blade is, again, this is 0.8 millimeters. This is very small. And so the small tip I'm making in the line that is how optic nerve fibers come into the eye. So we're trying to do minimal damage to the nerve fibers going in line with them and hopefully not cutting across them. So I made an incision in there. I apologize for the light, but the, we have the light very close to see the drusen in, so it's kind of, it, it is wild the drusen since they're light colored, they're white, and so there's a lot of reflection. But first of all, I tried to pick it free with just a lighted pick. This is a little, uh, basically just a milk, if you will, that's blunt. And you, you see that thing moving there? That's this rock moving within the uh, nerve. I try to use a suction device similar to the injection device we used earlier to do those macular translocation. Hope I could just suck the drusen out. This worked in a later case, and I'll talk about that in, in a second. But uh, in this case, it worked to cut the drusen and basically roll it out through this little incision in the nerve. And you'll see. That is, it is purely a rock. It's a substance that forms. That was a half of drusen coming out. The other half is still up here. And you can see it's over there. 
This is very uh, to cement and using a diamond dusted forceps. Uh, I grasped these things and thought that I would just directly pull it out, but watch what happens. It's like grabbing a piece of cement. It just breaks off. Very, very gentle in pulling it out. You can't even let the forceps close on their own. You have to just barely touch them to be moved a bit. Little hemorrhage right, right where we pulled it out, as expected, because this is a very vascular structure. The nerve, by the way, is 1.5 millimeters in width. So you can see at the, at the level we're working here. These are retinal forceps uh, that actually uh, we use to remove separate membranes in macular degeneration. You can see the other half of that large uh, drusen coming out. Um, and now I had set it down next to the nerve so that people could see what was going because I knew the light was so bright that you really couldn't see it very well. Um, I and set it down so that I could let my coronary arteries refill because I uh, you know, it was a heart attack, you know, working on this in all area. I hadn't been done before. And also to let my fellow rest for a second because he was having a heart attack. Uh, kidding about that. Going to have a heart attack. But anyway, uh, we moved those small drews in, as you saw there. And if I had music turned on, you could have heard my son's band playing um, a song. <laughs> and anyway, uh, they were the same material that Don Gas had. I described and were consistent with optic nerve fed reason. And Hans, I did send the pathology to Hans. I left and, the conference. Uh, this is what the drusen looks like under under EM, and you really don't uh, care about the makeup of them. Uh, put operatively, it's expected. She came the first day and she had no life perception vision. Um, we shared an office at that point in time with an I left class, the con but, conference. And uh, at the seven, he came out, he examined her before I did, and, and said, you know, she can see in that eye. She had uh, improved to 2.500 vision. She she came in and said, I can see. I, I haven't been able to see for years. Uh, and at times, she was 5,200 in that, that eye. She actually went from night perception, which we thought was impossible to do, uh, to 5,200 vision. She wasn't than 5200 because she has this big scar in the center part of her vision, which I would expect would be 5200 vision. But at 10, you can see what her optic nerve looks like. And uh, 10 months, we I picture uh, or took the photo pre-op and took the photo now at 10 months, and you can see the difference in the, in the nerve. Uh, unfortunately, can't fix these pigment changes because those are RPE cells below the retina that have been damaged. Uh, from the ischemic optic neuropathy. In further cases, and these were all very elderly patients that were referred by the for, for, for fighting blindness, uh, and we that there are actually three different types of, of drusen formations. Uh, this saw, which is intermittent drusen, there are various pieces of drusen that were that had a full ring. It was just like the the string that goes around. A, uh, in your yard around uh, uh, an immune system. Um, they were solid and very, very difficult to break and had to develop an instrument to be able to take care of those. And one lady that was uh, in her late 80s uh, wanted to, to give it a try and with a small incision and sh the, that thing had broken down into the, the little shotgun shots. There were thousands of little shots of the cement in there and you could lift uh, we made the incision right in here, and you I just sucked these out, and probably for 20 or 30 minutes to get them all out, and lifted the edge, and you could look in through our optic nerve, and the only thing left was the the artery, the vein, and um, uh, neurological tissue. That, so she really didn't improve significantly in her vision because there was no neurological tissue left. So if we do these patients, they need to be done earlier. So thrives. The discontinuous drusen in the first patient, continuing ring that's strangulating the nerve vascular bundle, and the small shot, which is probably the breakdown of the, the second type of drusen over time as the patient ages. Uh, we developed a, an instrument to crack the drusen. This is basically like a Abraham Lincoln's chopping block to, to, to break wood. Uh, in the and we found that we can actually safely remove drusen in, in these patients. I don't recommend that it be routinely simply because most patients don't lose vision, and so uh, we've only in those four patients. Uh, but if they, if they're a young patient and they have marked, marked 
duty decrease and ischemic apoptosis or vascular attenuation. One thing I point out in the video was, was the fact that the vessels were very thin and they went back to normal uh, as we pulled out that first uh, lump of Jerusalem that started perfusing again, which is probably why our vision improved so much. So I've been able to I've give you a surgery can be used to treat various uh, diseases and return vision to uh, many patients uh, with uh, vitreoretinal surgery. Do you have any questions? And thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. I, I realize we're at the top of the hour, Dr. Lambert, but I mean, I know you intimated uh, this at the beginning, but for an ophthalmologist, ophthalmology can sometimes seem so mysterious and impenetrable. And I mean, one, both the clarity of your presentation, and, and two, actually showing the surgery, the surgeries, it really is fantastic for us. And, and I think increases, you know, great is our appreciation for the work that ophthalmologists do, and retinal surgeries, surgeons in particular, but also increases our comfort in providing services to individuals to, who come to us with um, with uh, eye disease. Right. I frequently offer the chance to be able to speak to you. Um, uh, one thing you probably didn't know is that I was a, a pilot in the Air Force before I went into vitreo retinal surgery. So at the end of my talks, I, I uh, bow the, the men who are out there fighting for us, and the women who are out there fighting for us today. Uh, we're still at war. So. That, that's tremendously admirable, and, and uh, uh, definitely uh, all of us second that. Uh, so, so thank you again, Dr. Lambert. This has been fantastic. You're, you're welcome. Have a good day. You too. Thank Bye -bye. you.